Thank you all for being here and for the organizers especially. I am going to give an introduction to Bayesian methods. If you have already been using Bayesian methods in your research, this will probably um, be a bit um, straightforward to you, but if you have never encountered, encountered Bayesian methods before, hopefully you'll get a sense of what's involved. So what my hope is, is to go through the building blocks of Bayesian methods. And um, it culminates in getting a posterior distribution. And the, let me make sure I get this right. Okay, um, it, a posterior distribution is going to be composed of a likelihood function and priors, or a prior. So we're going to discuss what a likelihood is. I'm sure you've all used likelihoods before, but from discussions with some astronomers, there's um, some confusion about what, what it actually is. And then we'll talk about priors, different ways of specifying priors, what, um, what you as astronomers often do to specify priors. But, um, but again, we're gonna keep things rather, rather simple. But note that um, throughout this week, you're gonna have more discussions on different topics. Uh, I believe later today, you'll hear about Markov chain Monte Carlo, some things about selecting priors later in the week, Bayesian model comparison, and then hierarchical Bayesian modeling. As we proceed, please feel free to ask questions. Um, it's best to get any sort of um, issues with, with clarity here addressed right away because the slides will, will build on each other. All right, so Bayesian methods, um, or a, a Bayesian, a statistician who, or anyone who uses Bayesian methods, often um, rely on this thing called the, the likelihood principle. The likelihood principle says that all of the information in a sample is contained in the likelihood function. Uh, the data are modeled by the, the likelihood function. And, um, and it's the case that not all statistical paradigms agree with this principle. Um, some frequentist approaches, for example, um, build in, when doing inference, the, um, the experimental design. And so Bayesian methods do not. They just say once your likelihood function is specified, you can proceed with inference. And all the information you need is in that likelihood. So what is a likelihood? We are going to, let's see. Yeah. We're gonna consider a simple case here where we have a random sample. Uh oh, I'm doing the same thing. It is actually kind of tricky. <laughs> okay. Uh, a random sample of size one from a normal distribution, a Gaussian distribution. That Gaussian distribution is centered at three, so its mean is three, and its standard deviation is two. I'm gonna write it this way. This is a random variable X drawn from a normal distribution with mean three and standard deviation two. The probability density function of this random variable X, that will ultimately be what we draw, that would be our observation, we would write as f of x comma theta. So x is the um, random quantity here. It's the variable quantity in a density. And then theta is something that is fixed and unknown. So, um, so theta is fixed and x is variable. A Gaussian density is written in this way, which you may have seen before. And based on the parameters I've selected here, um, I've just plugged them in and then I drew the, um, the density curve. So when the data have not been drawn, the density is describing the distribution of the data, and we're just gonna draw one observation. So we see it's more likely we're gonna draw an observation near the mean, which is three, but we could also get something in the tail. Then the likelihood function is the, func the same function, except now we've switched what's variable and what's fixed. So the likelihood function is going to say that um, it's a function of your parameter, it's a function of theta, and then x, your data, has been observed, and so that is now fixed. Okay, so we have the same function, except now it's a function of the unknown parameters. I drew the likelihood here for an observation, so if I drew, if I drew from the PDF, the probability density function, and got the value 1.747, so that would be like our data, then um, this would be the likelihood function for mu. Okay. 
Okay, so again, it's a function of mu, and um, and the data are held fixed. Yep. So say they can be uh, multiple variables, like here you have both mu and sigma. Yes. And, yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I um I was just showing you the the case for mu, and actually I was assuming sigma was fixed. But indeed, since there are two unknown parameters, your likelihood function is two dimensional. So we would have it coming out as a in the, the third dimension. Other questions about this? Okay. All right, so now let's suppose we get a, a larger sample size. And in this larger sample size, um, we're drawing 50 observations from the same normal distribution. Okay, so we've, we've drawn from, um, from the probability density function, assuming a particular mu and sigma. And now we want to we want to, um, to write out what the, um, the likelihood function is. So x is fixed. And assuming that, um, assuming that your observations were drawn independently, then the joint distribution becomes a product of the marginal distributions. So that's by independence, that so you can write it this way. And here we have our likelihood function for the observations, xi. If we were to write then the, um, the likelihood function for mu, assuming that sigma is fixed and known, we get this. And this blue dotted line shows us the sample mean. And in this case, the sample mean is actually located where the likelihood is maximized. So I'm gonna have a slide about maximum likelihood estimation. But the process of it is that you, um, you have your likelihood function and then your estimator is where the maximum occurs. Because we know that we know the truth is three, you can see how um, based on the sample size of 50, so in this one, one data set, we would have estimated the, um, the parameter mu with, did I write it down? Uh, two, two point something, 2.75, let's say. Okay. If we increase the sample size, we can look at how the likelihood changes. So this, what, this black curve was one we were just looking at. And when we get up to a sample size of 500, we see that the, um, the likelihood is narrowing and, um, and it's peaking closer to, um, to the truth. Okay, so once you have your likelihood specified, um, the likelihood principle says so we, we have our model, we have our likelihood, now we want to make an inference on theta, or whatever your unknown parameter or parameters are. So how do you do that? I just said that one frequentist approach, or classical approach, is using maximum likelihood estimation. And so that's just saying, given your, given your likelihood, you find the value um, of the parameter that, um, that matches the, the maximum of the likelihood. And so you can, for, um, for a Gaussian distribution, easily derive that, and it's the sample mean. Okay, so, so that works out. Maybe you've done that before. Okay, so, oh, yep. Uh, it looks like in this example, you have to start with a model of Gaussian statistics yep. in order to do this problem. So in, so in, yeah, in general, you're going to choose a model based on um, the randomness in your, your data. So the, um, whatever the data generating mechani mechanism is, maybe it's a Poisson distribution, maybe it's a beta distribution. It could be um, far more complicated than that. And you ultimately would just have to work out what the likelihood function is. So you'll have your joint, um, your, your PDF, your distribution on the data. Once your data are fixed, you just have to maximize the likelihood with respect to the unknown parameters. And that will give you the maximum likelihood estimates. Okay, and it, it can be in higher dimensions than just one. Yeah, but it does rely on a specification of, of the model. Was there anything else? Okay, so, um, so there are these, there are classical or frequentist methods that rely on a certain understanding um, of the parameters and then Bayesian methods, which we'll focus on today. And the, the biggest difference for, for our purposes today to recognize is that with frequentist methods, oops, with frequentist methods, 
the unknown parameters are considered fixed, fixed and unknown. And what you'd like to do is estimate them or do some sort of inference on them. But in Bayesian methods, they are, um, your parameters are considered to be random variables. And so your uncertainty is captured in theta as a random variable. And since it's a random variable, it makes sense to put distributions on it, like prior distributions. Okay, so, um, so that's one of the big differences. Also with frequentist or classical methods, um, a lot of the performance is based on this notion of repeated sampling. So you have your one data set, and how you interpret things like confidence intervals are based on many independent repetitions of these data sets that you don't actually take, but in order to interpret this notion of confidence, that's what you do. And so, um, so the underlying, so underlying frequentist methods is this notion of considering all possible data sets of, of size n. For Bayesian methods, you don't do that. You only consider the data set that you have, and your inference is based on that data set, not on additional data sets. So what's going to happen is you'll have some prior understanding of your parameters. You put down your prior distribution, and then you say, given this data set, how, how is my understanding of the uncertainty in the parameters updated? And so, um, so so we'll be, um, we'll be, as I said, working with Bayesian methods. I'm not gonna do as much of a comparison between the two, but there are some interesting places where they clash, even with, with simple problems. Sometimes you can get similar answers um, between the two types of methods, but their interpretation is always different. Okay, so the, um, for Bayesian methods, it's really just about conditional probabilities. Um, all statisticians use conditional probabilities. And this is the, the basic setup. So in this, um, this situation, we rely on Bayes' rule. So if we have A and B as two events in the same sample space, which I'm gonna represent here as um, these circles in the Venn diagram, then the probability of A given B, so this vertical line here is A given B, which means A, we're conditioning on B. So A conditioned on being in B, um, that probability is the probability of the intersection of the two events over the probability of B. And so we can see that, so if we have this event A that's happening, then, um, then if we want the probability of, of being in A, given that we're in B, we take the intersection, right, so this region, and divide by the probability of being in B. Okay, so this is the idea of conditional probabilities, and that's what Bayesian methods rely on. Okay, so what is a posterior distribution? The posterior is a distribution now on our parameter space, so theta, if that's our unknown parameter, we put a distribution on that space which quantifies our uncertainty in that parameter given the data that we've observed. So again, that conditional on the data. So this, again, the vertical line means given or conditioned on what we've observed here. The posterior distribution is equal to our likelihood function, which we discussed, times the prior distribution so our, our current understanding of the uncertainty in the parameter space. And then it's normalized so that it's a probability, which means that um, we make it integrate to one. Okay, so that's, um, this is just the extended or expanded form. And sometimes we'll just write that the posterior distribution is proportional to the likelihood times the prior. Okay, so the prior distribution allows you to, to easily incorporate your um, beliefs about the parameters of interest or your uncertainty in the parameters of interest. I say easily because that can often be um, the trickiest part, trying to capture your understanding of the parameters and use it and put it into a prior distribution. And then the posterior distribution, again, is a distribution on the parameter space given your data. So um, it's our, our theta, given the data, and now given our posterior, we can understand 
um, understand the, the uncertainty in it. We can do things like point estimation, credible intervals, and other sorts of inference. So I'm going to go through some examples, and um, there's, there are a lot of equations, and unless you're familiar with working with various sorts of distributions, this, um, this just looks messy. I'm only going to make a few points here. First point is um, we're going to start from a Gaussian um, likelihood. So our data are drawn from some Gaussian distribution with mean, mu, and standard deviation sigma. So we have our Gaussian likelihood, and then I'm picking a prior distribution. The prior that I pick, in this case, is a normal distribution. And so here, I'm now trying to specify what the, the posterior distribution ends up being, in this case where I have a Gaussian likelihood and a Gaussian prior. One can work through the details, but the, the message is just that we end up with a Gaussian posterior, which is nice because we know what those are. And this is how the, uh, the parameters are updated given our data. So we see that, um, that we have the specification of the prior parameters in the posterior mean, but then also the data come into play. So what does that look like? Let's suppose that we draw four observations from our Gaussian distribution, and, um, and then our prior was specified. Okay, so we're drawing from a normal that's centered at three with a standard deviation of two. I'm going to set a prior that's centered at negative three, but has a standard deviation of five. Okay, so this is our prior in red, and we see that it's rather broad. And then we have our, our likelihood in black that's been, um, it's been normalized so that we can see the comparison. And then the posterior in green. So we see that the, the prior is actually not affecting the posterior that much. I made the prior broader. If instead I had put more information in the prior in that it, um, it wasn't as, as broad, we see that it actually pulls the posterior in the direction of the prior. So if you really believe your prior, then that's okay. But if you don't believe your prior and you're trying to have some sense of non-informativeness um, to it, then you don't want it to affect your posterior so much. And um, so I was using four observations. Now, if I have that same prior, but just have a lot more data, we see that the data will start to, to overwhelm the prior anyway, in, in many cases. So if you have a ton of data, um, that's, that can be good. So even, um, so even in this situation, we see that the, the likelihood is, um, or sorry, that the, this prior does not have that much of an effect. If you have a small sample size, then you should be especially careful. All right, so this is just another example where you can work through on your own. I've just um, specified a particular model that's a uniform. It's uniform between zero and theta. And then I put a particular prior on theta. And uh, if you want to work through the details, you can see how you can get a, a posterior. So these are posted. It was just another example to see how you could work through those cal calculations. Okay, so now let's get into a bit about prior distribution. The prior distribution, as I said before, allows you to easily incorporate your beliefs about the parameter of interest. But how to do that is not so straightforward. If you somehow already had a prior, then that's great. Um, so if one has a specific prior in mind, then it fits nicely into this definition. But, um, but one of the, the common questions is, how do you select a prior? And um, most statisticians would ask that right back to you. Well, what, what do you think? Because um, that's, it's supposed to be the, um, the expert knowledge in, in the subject put into a prior. Okay. Um, but how do you go from prior information to a prior distribution? And what if you don't actually have prior information? What can you do? So there are several ways of choosing priors. Um, and I've just listed a, a few options. One is informative or subjective priors. 
That's where you're actually taking your particular um, already um, your, your understanding or expertise in a field and saying that this is our current belief in the uncertainty on the parameter space and we're just going to use that and see if new data changes um, our understanding. There are also objective, non-informative, vague default priors. These generally have the, the same sort of connotation. They're trying to do the same thing. We'll discuss this in a bit more detail. Um, with hierarchical models, you can put um, priors on your priors. So you have hyper priors. So we'll, we'll discuss that. And then also conjugate priors, which are priors selected for convenience. What's an example of a conjugate? I'm so glad you asked. She said, uh, Deborah asked, what's an example of a conjugate prior? I'm going to go through some. Okay. Yeah. So conjugate priors. <laughs> the, a conjugate prior is such that the posterior distribution is in the same family as the prior. So what do I be, mean by that? Well, we already saw with a Gaussian prior and a Gaussian likelihood that we got a Gaussian posterior. So both the prior and the posterior were Gaussian. They're in the same family. Okay, so um, so if so by family I mean in this case um, Gaussian, and so we'll see that certain priors are conjugate to certain likelihoods, and so that can be a convenient way to um, to get a posterior. Here are some others. So we saw the normal normal. Um, it turns out we have. Um, the case that beta priors are conjugate with binomial likelihoods, gamma priors are conjugate with Poisson likelihoods, Dirichlet priors are conjugate with multinomial likelihoods. It's very likely that these these distributions are not familiar to you, but I'm going to go I'm going to derive some of these so we can see how how it's um, working out. There are some others. Um, there there are a finite number of conjugate priors though, so. Um, it doesn't work for everything. So let's look at the beta binomial. Suppose that we have a data generating mechanism that works like this. Uh, we have IID samples from a Bernoulli theta. So um, a Bernoulli distribution has two possible outcomes, zero or one. It, um, the outcome is one with probability theta. So you could think of a, a coin flip being heads or tails, that would be Bernoulli anything of that, uh, of that nature where either something happens or it doesn't. So it's one or zero with prob one with probability theta, zero with probability one minus theta. And, um, and so we're gonna take a sample from that. So we have a bunch of X's and X's that are either zero or one. And it turns out that if you just add up all those values, you have a new distribution and that distribution is binomial. So we um, specify this distribution with n and theta. So n is the sample size, so the number of Bernoulli draws, the number of ones and zeros. And then theta is the probability of success, so the probability that some event or occurrence happen. And with a binomial distribution, we have the following model. So the probability that a binomial random variable y equals k, so the probability that it equals 0, 1, 2, up to n can be written in this way. And we want to get the posterior distribution for theta. Okay, so we have this model and, um, and we can specify the likelihood, but, um, but ultimately we want to know about theta given the data that we would, uh, we would be observing. And so we have a binomial likelihood and need to specify a prior on theta. We should note that theta is a probability, so it has to be between zero and one. And so uh, a natural choice is a beta distribution. Um, the beta distribution is defined between zero and one. And, um, and so if we use that, and I'll show some pictures, um, we'll find that given a beta prior and a binomial likelihood, the posterior for theta is also beta. Okay, so it's nice because once you have a, one of these name distributions, you know what your posterior is and it's easy to work with. Okay. This is just if you want to look at it, um, how you can show that they're in the same family. We, just, we have the likelihood times the prior. We have the um, denominator of the posterior. You'll see things cancel and you can, you can see how you get your posterior that's beta. 
Okay, so what does this look like? Well, we have our, our theta. Um, if we chose, so we have, if we want to pick a beta prior, this is what the beta density looks like. We have to pick a parameter alpha and a parameter beta. If I choose um, one and one for those parameters, it turns out that you just get a uniform distribution. So a beta distribution with your parameters each equal to one is just a uniform between zero and one. And this, um, I, I generated a data set, and this is what your posterior could look like, depending on, on what you observe. Okay, and then if we try some different values for the, um, the alpha and beta, we'll get um, different results. So we see in, in red, this has an alpha of three and a beta of two, and then the resulting posterior is a solid red. <coughs> We can use a beta one half, one half. This is gonna come up later as a Jeffrey's prior. And, um, and then the resulting posterior is in green here. So we see that depending on the prior and given the, the data, this was all conditional on the same data set, we get different posteriors. So we would end up with different inferences based on different, um, different previous understandings of uncertainty on beta. Okay, what if we had a Poisson distribution? So I believe you'll, you're all familiar with a Poisson distribution. So, um, so suppose our model is Poisson, conditional on some, some lambda. The question might be what prior to use for lambda? And it turns out because lambda has to be greater than zero, a nice choice is um, what's called the gamma distribution. Um, these are some, um, some different gamma curves, depending on the, um, the values that you set for the parameters alpha and beta. This works out that, um, so some details if you want to go through them later, just to make sure you have a sense of what's happening. The gamma distribution is the conjugate prior for Poisson likelihoods. So if you have a Poisson likelihood and you use a gamma prior on your alpha, then your posterior is also gamma. Again, this is nice because then you have the, the shape of the distribution and it's easy to work with because most of your software will, um, will have these, um, these functions available. And so using the same likelihood, the, or sorry, the same data set, and different, um, different priors here, uh, we see that we get um, slightly different posteriors. So the posteriors in this case are in, in black, and then the likelihood normalized is in blue. Okay, as, it, as would be expected, the prior in this case is pulling the posterior a little bit more away from the likelihood than this one where it's a bit more broad. Okay, so um, conjugate priors are a nice way to go if you don't want to do a lot of um, computational, use a lot of computational techniques. But, um, but if you do want to use those, you can work with hierarchical priors. A hierarchical prior is really just saying, let's put a prior on our prior. And uh, th this is the simplest way of, of showing the hierarchical modeling. It's gonna come up later where you'll get into far more advanced hierarchical modeling, but just to illustrate how this can work, you'll have your likelihood, conditional on your parameter of interest theta, and then some hyper priors, some hyper parameters, and then you have your prior, which is conditional on your hyper parameter, and then you have another distribution that's um, specifying the hyper prior. So, so ultimately, though, you can layer it as many times as you want, as many layers as you want, but, um, but you'll ultimately have to have some distribution with a, a full, some, um, some parameter with a fully known distribution. So it's assumed that that last level is fully known. There are no unknown parameters. You have to specify some sort of value. And um, again, this, um, this extra parameter would be called a hyperparameter. More layers can be added, but you'll have to use things often like MCMC or, or other sampling techniques. 
Okay. And I know that the eccentricity of detected exoplanets peaks at about 0.4, and maybe there's it has some shape. We'll mm -hmm. just call it Gaussian. Mm -hmm. Then would the Gaussian distribution be the prior, but then the hyper prior would be that I know eccentricities have to be between zero and one. Or uh, okay, how so would you, yeah. yeah, okay, so so let me try saying it in this way. Um, okay. So suppose yeah, because this can kind of fit in. Suppose you have a likelihood, and the only thing unknown is the mean, and you have a sense of what the mean is, but you're not r super confident that it's, um, that it's correct. So, so now you could put um, an extra layer of uncertainty on that mean. So it's no longer just a, a, a prior on that mean, but you've put a prior on the mean of that prior. So it's a matter of layering it. So if you know that, um, if you think that certain parameters have some sort of restricted region, uh, you could just um, use any, you could specify a, um, a one stage prior using that. Mm -hmm. It's more if you want some sense of um, layering the uncertainty to make it, how shall I put it, so in some ways more robust to misspecifications. So you're letting randomness kind of work out the details. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, look at that a bit more. So an okay. example from physics is there's quite a few cases where well-meaning experimentalists would measure the fine structure constant or the speed of light. Mm -hmm. And for many years, all their examples would cluster around some value. Mm -hmm. They'd all come in one sigma of one another of 1 over 137, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Someone comes in with a new technique turns out it's a better technique, and all of a sudden their value jumps, you know, from up here to down there. Hmm. All those guys are quoting their little one sigma error bars, and if you gave that too much weight, mm -hmm. you'd actually be penalizing the people who came in with a new and better measurement technique. Mm -hmm. Would you use a hyper prior to say, we know all those guys meant well, <laughs> but in fact, their real uncertainty is five times what they quoted. And thus, my new experiment, which I know is a lot better than their clunky experiment, should be trusted more than the priors. Yeah, so um, there are different ways of addressing that. If you know in advance, for example, that there's going to be some issues with how things were previously done, one option is just disregard it and try to specify a prior that's going to work um, with your, your new, or with, with a likelihood. So if you don't believe the prior information, then I wouldn't use it, right? Like, it's more if you have some level of, of confidence in it and you think it's, um, it's a, it captures the current state of knowledge in a way that you at least agree with. Um, but yeah, I suppose you, you could also um, layer it, but even, even layering that uncertainty, if it's such a huge jump, um, it's not clear that, that just um, layering it in this way would kind of I don't know. Move, move the posterior where it's uh, where you think it should be. So, so you could do it. I mean, yeah. There, there are lots of ways of specifying priors. But if yeah, if if you're skeptical about what's already been done, I would just come up with your own non-informative. Yeah. Okay. So to return to Deborah's question, if there's something you really know, like the mass is not negative or the eccentricity is almost zero. Your prior shouldn't have any support at something yep. that is physically impossible. So maybe you truncate your Gaussian at zero or choose a distribution that doesn't extend beyond zero, maybe log something. Mm -hmm. um, in a case like Chad's was referring to, where people have claimed to place likelihoods, and, and you don't think they're entirely just making stuff up, but you think that maybe they haven't accurately characterized their mm -hmm. true uncertainty. That's sort of where you as a scientist have to bring your, your intuition, and you might do something like say, well, I'm going to put a scale factor and say, I think they've over sort of interpreted their data by a factor of, I don't know, beta, but I don't know what beta is. So maybe I want to put a hyperparameter on beta yeah. for how much should I scale their uncertainty by so as to, to agree with this new set of observations that I think might be Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Anything else with this? Angie? Yeah, I'm
Thanks. Anything else? Okay. So non-informative prior. So what do we do if we don't have a, um, relevant prior information? What are our, uh, what if our models are too complex to know what reasonable priors would be because you have so many and you don't know how they're gonna work together? So sometimes the desire is for a prior that does not favor any particular value of the parameter space. Quick side note that um, I find of interest, but um, some may have philosophical issues with um, with specifying a prior when you don't have prior information. R.A. Fisher, who Eric mentioned earlier, um, came up with this uh, different approach to inference called fiducial inference, fiducial inference which uh, my dissertation was on. So I actually find it quite interesting, generalized fiducial inference, that is. But, um, but yeah, so there, there are different perspectives on this. We'll discuss... Oops, We'll discuss some methods for finding non-informative priors. Um, and I'll, I'll also just say what some are, and you can look them up later if you'd like to try them. Um, one thing about non-informative priors, and I'm going to say this again, uh, often I found that astronomers just like to put uniform priors on things within some physically meaningful range. That's certainly one way to capture non-informativeness. But there are a number of other ways to do that, depending on what you mean by non-informative. So a uniform prior does one thing, but maybe you want it so that your prior doesn't affect the, the likelihood as much. And so you might want to do something like a Jeffries prior, which we'll talk about in a second. Another thing about uniform priors is that um, they are not invariant to transformations. And so if you, as Eric also mentioned, want to take logs of things or square things, your non-informative prior suddenly becomes very informative. So I'll show you some examples. With some of these methods also for finding non-informative priors, it turns out that these priors can be what we call improper. So improper priors are priors that are not actually probability densities in that they don't integrate to one but instead they'll integrate to infinity. And when that happens, it's not the end of the world, it just means that you have to now check that your posterior is proper. If your posterior is proper, even with an improper prior, you can still work with it. But sometimes it's the case that with an improper prior, you end up with an improper posterior, and that you cannot work with. Okay, so, um, so that just means that if your prior is improper, you have to check the posterior. Okay, so here's a case um, where you can have an improper prior, but have a proper posterior. So this is with a, a Gaussian distribution, as we saw before. If we just put a uniform, a uniform prior on the mean from negative infinity to infinity, that does not integrate to one, and, um, and so it's improper. But the resulting posterior is a normal distribution. Since it's a normal, we know that that's a density, and therefore it integrates to one. So that's fine. Um, a case where you have an improper prior that leads to an improper posterior is specified here. And in this case, if we're drawing from a Bernoulli, and so we end up with a binomial distribution, we could specify a beta negative one, negative one prior. It turns out that this is improper in that it integrates to negative infinity. Um, and it actually, in some cases, uh, will be also an improper posterior. So if you observe a y of zero or n, so remember we're counting the numbers of zeros or ones, if that ends up being zero, maybe there are zero ones or n ones, the resulting posterior will be improper. So you can work that out on your own later if you like. So again, if you use improper priors, you have to check that the posterior is proper. So the uniform prior, this is what seems to be favored among astronomers. Um, I have it just between zero and one here, but um, you know maybe it's between zero and 20 or, or whatever, um, depending on the parameter you're dealing with. Um, so what's nice about it and what seems to be the draw is that you look at it and you say, oh, it's just, it's treating all the values of theta equally, right? So if um, all values are equally possible, you have no belief on or understanding of what theta should be. But the problem is that if you start doing transformations of your parameters, you're going to get 
priors that look like this. Where, um, so in this case, all I did was, um, was consider theta, theta squared instead. So this, um, I should adjust this labeling. But, um, but you end up with a prior that's actually very informative suddenly. And you could imagine doing that with, um, with logs or other sort of transformations. So if you, um, if you know what parameter is of interest and you're not going to transform it, and that's the, the scale that you're going to be working with, then that's fine. It's just if you start looking at transformed um, values of the parameter, your, your prior has now, um, has now been altered. So I just say, notice that the above is not uniform. It's, um, it's now informative. So some would say, um, especially statisticians, would say that that's an undesirable pro property of the uniform. And so instead would want to consider um, other, other types of priors instead. Is there a question? No? Okay. So this is just jumping back for a second. Um, there are a number of reasons why you might not have information. Your work might be the first of its kind, and there really isn't a previous understanding of the parameters of interest. Maybe you're skeptical about previous results, and to the point where you don't want to rely on it at, at all. Um, maybe that happens. Um, the parameter space is too high dimensional to understand how an informative prior or informative priors would work together. Maybe other reasons. So if this is the case, and you may like priors to have little effect on the resulting posterior. So there are some ways of doing that. One is Jeffrey's prior, and we're going to discuss this next. But there are other ways of doing that, um, various sorts of reference priors where uh, they do things like trying to um, maximize the, the difference between the, the resulting posterior and the prior. So that um, so if you, if you try to pick a prior that is really different from your posterior, that's saying that the prior didn't have that much effect. And so there are different ways of, of doing that. And so I give a, a reference here. Um, there's some more discussions. There's more discussion about selecting priors in, in this paper. It's a, a little bit older paper, but it could be of interest. Okay, so Jeffrey's prior relies on the, um, the Fisher information. So this is the, um, the formula for that for exponential families. It works out to be an easier, an easier form. Um, so we have the, the log of the likelihood function, the first derivative of that, the expected value squared. Just think of it as it's trying in some way to get some sense of the information in your data. So um, this, this Fisher information is understood to be a proxy for the information content. Um, so high values correspond to likely values of theta. Um, using this will reduce the effect of the prior on the posterior. It's most useful in single parameter settings. It turns out when you have um, multiple parameters, it's not recommended to use a, um, a multi-dimensional version of this. Sometimes people will use those as marginal priors still, but, um, but just take care if, um, if you're dealing with, with more parameters than one. And there's some more discussion about this um, in this book. Okay, so let's, uh, let's do one example with the exponential distribution. So this would be how we form our likelihood. This is the density. Um, I go through the calculations of um, getting the Fisher information. And ultimately, we get that the Jeffries prior looks like this. OK, so we don't need to talk through these calculations, but um, you can look at it later. It's just it's a recipe for finding a Je the Jeffries prior for the one parameter setting. Okay, um, what's nice about Jeffrey's prior is that it's invariant to one-to-one uh, -one transformations. And just to show you what that means, so again, we have this as our prior. What if now we want this new parameter phi, and it's a function of theta, and it's actually theta squared? Then we can work out what the Jeffrey's, Jeffrey's prior is. So, this, uh, so theta has a particular distribution there are techniques for determining what the updated distribution is based on some transformation with this Jacobian. And it turns out then, if you work out these details, the Jeffries prior for our transformed random variable is one over phi, which is the same as what we had here. Okay, so I did a transformation, but the resulting prior is the same. That's, um, 
a desirable property, at least according to statisticians. Okay, um, this is another example of calculating the Fisher information um, and using it for a binomial. So we're gonna, we found here the Jeffries prior for theta. So remember, theta is a probability, the probability of success. One can look through all these details and then see that the Jeffries prior looks like this, which means that the Jeffries prior for theta is a beta one half, one half. Okay, so this is um, the part of the density for a beta one half, one half. Okay, so that's great. This is what it looks like. We saw this in an earlier slide. So this is the, the Jeffries prior, and it's putting more weight at the, um, at the bounds, which is where um, the likelihood, where, where data would have more information. So in some sense, it's trying to, um, to match the information in the likelihood so that the prior doesn't um, have as much of an effect on the likelihood. It's not, the idea is to not pull it too much in, um, in a direction. Okay, so, um, so one thing to note too, since this is our Jeffries prior, in order to get the posterior, we see that the posterior works out to also be beta. So the prior was beta, and the posterior is beta, right? So it, we already knew that um, the beta is the conjugate prior for a binomial likelihood. So we actually already knew that it was going to do this. But what's nice about it is because it's a beta, we know it's proper. So the um, so priors derived from a um, from Jeffrey's method aren't always proper, and so you would typically have to check this. And um, in this case, it's just a coincidence that Jeffrey's prior is, is the conjugate prior. Okay, so you can look at the Gaussian case on your own if you'd like later. So, so once you've spec you have your likelihood, you've specified your prior, and yes? Uh, uh, astronomers find that power law distributions are very common. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a <coughs> form of desirable prior for Pareto? Possibly, I, and offhand, I, I'm not sure. Um, the Pareto is conjugate with a uniform likelihood, but that's not what you're asking. So, I don't know. Have you seen what people no, do? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I think astronomers don't know the answer to that question. I was wondering. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, offhand, I don't. I could think about it and okay. see. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, so once you have your likelihood and prior, and you can get your posterior. Um, there are several things you might want to do with a posterior distribution. Um, one is point estimation, right? You want to actually estimate the unknown parameter. So there are different ways of doing it. You can use a posterior mean. Maybe you want the posterior mode. Um, there are ways of doing it. Um, also, we have credible regions, which I'm going to talk about um, one slide in, in one slide on the next slide, I believe. And, um, and so it's the probability of your unknown parameter falling in some region R. And what we're going to highlight, too, is that this is actually very different, S similar idea, but very different from a confidence interval in the frequentist setting. You also might want to, um, to do prediction, predicting future observations. And so you can come up with a posterior predictive distribution. So given the data you have, um, predicting what future observations would look like. So you, various things you might do with, um, with posterior. Oh, and I just work out some details that you can look at. Okay, so I just wanted to take a minute or two to talk about this, and then, um, and then we can address any questions you might have. But um, this has to do with the difference between confidence intervals and credible intervals. A confidence interval, which is what you would typically use with, um, with any sort of classical or frequentist approach, it's, oops, it's based on repeated sampling, so if I have or desire a 95% confidence interval for some unknown parameter, what I'm saying is that I want it to be such that if I were to repeatedly sample data sets of, of sample size n, so in the same, the same modeling, the same type of data, just an independent sample, and if I made a whole bunch of confidence intervals 
then 95% of these many, many, many intervals would capture the true unknown fixed parameter. Okay. Um, for finite numbers of repeated sampling, it'd be roughly 95%. If you have an infinite number, then 95% um, then would be the correct coverage. So in the, in the back of your mind, when you're doing confidence intervals, your interpretation is on this, this method or this technique for defining the intervals. And the interpretation is if you had a whole bunch of additional data sets and you define the intervals in the same way, 95% would, would capture the truth. What it's not saying is that I have a 95% confidence interval, therefore it's, there's a 95% chance that the true parameter is in that interval. That is not at all correct. Theta is fixed and unknown. The probability that it's in your interval is zero or one. It either is or it, or it isn't, and you don't know. Okay, so, so you can't say the probability of theta falling in your confidence interval is equal to 95%. It just doesn't make sense. Theta is not random in this classical situation. I like confidence intervals, though. It's, not, it's nothing against confidence intervals. It's just a, a different interpretation than what many would desire, which fits a bit better with, with the Bayesian, I'll call it the Bayesian version of it, though it's a, a different understanding. A 95% credible interval is based on the posterior distribution of your parameters. And because your parameters are random and you have its distribution, its posterior distribution, you can define a 95% credible interval. And the interpretation is that um, the probability of theta falling within your defined interval is, um, is 0.95 or 95%. Okay, because it's a random variable, this makes sense. And that's exactly what your posterior distribution can be used for. Yep. Can I just slide that 95%? You can move it anywhere. Yeah, yeah. I could have cut out this and said um, the probability that theta is um, less than negative 2 is, is 0 0.025. Yeah, you can do anything with it. I, I just cut this out just to give an illustration. So the center is not necessarily. Nope. Yeah, there's something called the um, highest posterior density interval, where the idea is to find the interval that's as narrow as possible, and it's easier to do when you have just one mode. But, um, but yeah, the, the intervals themselves can be drawn many different ways. Any other questions about this? OK. So I just want to summarize what we discussed, um, some just the basics of Bayesian methods. My hope is that if you weren't already familiar with the terminology, then later this week, as people um, discuss what, what they've been doing research, uh, in their research using Bayesian methods, you'll at least have some sense of, of what, um, what the jargon is. And so just a reminder, the posterior is, um, is proportional to the likelihood times the prior. There are different ways to select priors. There are subjective ways, conjugate priors, non-informative priors. Um, credible intervals and confidence intervals have different interpretations. That's very important. Um, and we'll be hearing a lot more about Bayesian methods later today and then also throughout the week. So thank you very much. Any yeah, so the question was that there's a tendency in astronomy to use non-informative priors. And is that then not taking advantage of the strength of, of Bayesian methods? Because you, you do have a lot of prior information that you're not actually building into, um, into current analyses. So, um, so to some extent, yes, you, um, you are then missing out on maybe getting new or updated posts. So given a new data set, if you use other um, more informative priors, you could have a, uh, a far more informative posterior. And so to that extent, you're, yeah, you're, you're missing out on, on it. But, but just taking someone else's posterior and using it as your prior, there can also be some issues that have to be worked out, like different, just making sure that how they got their posterior, there isn't any huge discrepancy between how that was done and, and what you're actually doing. So making sure that the prior on the parameter that you're using makes sense to use in your posterior. So you just have to be careful, but, um, 
but yeah, actually, I haven't seen many people using others post other previous works posteriors in um, in their current analysis. But yeah, it, it seems that it. Um, it should at least be investigated more or, or tried, and, and maybe doing that sort of analysis, and then also using some more non-informative prior, and just see how how they compare. So yeah, that's a really good point. Oh, okay. So, okay, perfect. Great, great example. Uh, Zavi just gave an example where um, some information from Kepler is used for radial velocity um, situations. So, okay, good. I stand corrected. I do now know of. Case where that, that happens. Eric? So you, you comment fairly thoroughly on issues in choosing your prior. Mm -hmm. What about choosing your likelihood? Yeah, choosing a likelihood, um, I, I guess the hope is that based on the randomness that's apparent in the setting, like if some, if, um, if counts are happening, like you know to do something Poisson, and if it's measurement error, you know to do something Gaussian. But yeah, it's. Do I? Should I always use a Gaussian measurement error? No, no. Please do not have that be your takeaway message. But like, they're starting points at least. Um, so yeah, I mean, defining the likelihood is uh, is not always easy. And um, there are, I mean, as, as you know, there are different ways. If you don't know your likelihood, but you know how to generate your data, you can um, you can generate data and estimate a likelihood, or you could generate data and um, and use that in um, in other sorts of approximate methods. But yeah, it's um, it can be just as hard to select a likelihood as a prior. Yeah. And just to follow on that. Yeah. Um. So the um, so the question was um, often the data generating process res um, results in like pretty extreme outliers, and your question is about dealing with outliers. Yeah. So dealing with outliers can be tricky. If you know or have some sense of what's causing them to be outliers, then um, and that's something that you're okay with removing. So it, my recommendation is generally don't remove outliers unless you know that they actually have an issue with like maybe miss um, someone input the wrong value or something like that. But but outliers can carry a lot of information, and so. Um, so you could just try using methods that are, are more robust to outliers. Um, I, the median was discussed. Um, so you, you can do things of, of that nature. But do you mean as far as specifying a model that's not Gaussian now because you have outliers? or? Yeah, I mean, just how do you deal? I mean, because real data, yeah. as I said earlier, three sigma isn't. Yeah. There's a reason for that because nature is mm -hmm. non-Gaussian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would just try going with, um, with various techniques that um, are known to be more robust. Like with regression, there are, are different ways of, of dealing with outliers. Um, I mean, sometimes it's, it is a matter of, of kind of thresholding and, and not using them, but, um, but you just would want to be careful with that. So um, you want to also be sure there are various diagnostics um, to check to make sure, especially with regression, to uh, make sure that certain observations aren't driving the result. And so you'd want to pay attention to, to those sorts of things as well. And if you do have outliers that, um, that are also um, kind of driving like the slope of a curve, you, you'd probably want to either remove them or do it twice, one with and one without, and, and have a sense of how it's comparing. So. Uh, okay, one last question from Eric, and then we should take our morning break. So the first things I thought about in Chad's question were replacing the Gaussian with a T distribution, or setting up a multi-level model where I had the, the width of my Gaussian be a, another parameter that I had prior on. Uh, are there advantages or disadvantages to either of those? That you know? Well, okay, so if you know your data are coming from a Gaussian, and if you don't know the mean and the standard deviation, and you want to have thicker tails, I mean, there are distributions with thicker tails, so you could use those, but if you, if you so I guess, yes, you, you could use a t-distribution, um, but yeah, so a t-distribution is fine. Um, so a t-distribution, for those who aren't, actually, you're probably all familiar. It's a Gaussian over the square root of a, of a chi-squared. And it looks just like a Gaussian distribution, but it has thicker tails. And its shape depends on things like the sample size. So yeah, so one, one option, if you want to ensure that, um, that you pay attention to the tails, 
you could, um, you could use a t distribution. If, if the outlier is also something that's just of interest on its own, there are techniques, um, so in statistics it's called extreme value theory, where it just deals with the tails of distributions. So you could look at, at that and try to understand um, the modeling of just the, the extremes. So that, that can be interesting. So it depends on, I guess, what you mean by, by the tail and if you, if you want it to, um, to have an effect on, on your analysis. So, but you, you said also hierarchical, yeah, I mean, there are lots of approaches. Me not listing off many isn't to say that there aren't ways of dealing with outliers, but uh, it, kind of, it depends on, um, on what your data actually are, and what you're trying to do, and, and that sort of thing. So. Comment from Eric? Um, oh, okay. So much of what you've said here and in this discussion afterwards is, you know, what about these, the tough situations? And I'm an editor of a journal, and, and I really, it's really hard to deal with it. So what I'm thinking that rather than trying to decide a single best approach that always works, that astronomers should be sort of flexible about how they write their papers. And they might say, for example, I have a model, I have a likelihood. Let's assume we actually have a likelihood. Yeah. So <laughs> let's just start section two. Let's just maximize the likelihood. We'll use maximum likelihood estimation, well-established techniques from the 20th century, and see what that gives scientifically. And then I have some prior information. I think I believe that the distribution of the star masses is, is probably salt eater or something. And, 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 and what's the effect of that? And then we'll do a Bayes analysis for the well established prior. And then, then I'll do sensitivity of the prior. Well, what if those, something is slightly different or is considerably different? And do that. And then, then write your, dis, your discussion, section five. What did I learn from the simple one? What did I learn from the prior I most preferred? What did I learn from the sensitivity analysis around it? And that's where you try to adjudicate, and if something has nothing to do with Bayesian, what if I left all my outliers in? What if I took them all out? What if I downweighted them using Huber's psi function, which, by the way, is a famous way of doing it? And, you know, uh, uh, um, what if I did it three ways and then discussed it? So for example, if my science didn't matter, I got the same answer within one sigma every time. Ah, I'm happy. <laughs> Very reliable science. What if my results flopped around hugely in my sort of science space? That, then I'd be worried that this particular observation is just not going to answer my science question with reliability. Reliable. And if astronomers took this more flexible approach to writing papers, not to doing an analysis, but doing different analyses, and then adjudicating it in the discussion, I would feel better as an editor. That looks really reliable, or that's flopping around. And frankly, you know, the editor should think about not accepting this. Maybe it just doesn't say much. If you only do one thing, you don't know how reliable. But as an editor, you should accept papers that admit their results flop around when they write your I much prefer that. <laughs> <laughs> because then we know that experiment, you know, then we put up a $100 million instrument and, and, and we couldn't get the result yet. Look at Ada Earth, right? It's not tough. I think we should have to take a break. Okay. Yep. So, okay. Jesse, do you have any comment on this? So, really quick, I think that's a, a nice approach. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we should take a br uh, break now uh, for about 20 minutes and try and be back here at 11.30.